Now again, um, a reasonable inspection, a landlord has a duty to conduct a reasonable inspection before passing possession to a tenant when there is potential serious danger which is foreseeable. And again, it, it, it's basically saying it in a different way that we've already talked about. Now what I'm going to talk to you now about is what's called the unfair deceptive acts and practices. We always um, shorten it by saying UDAP. Now how many people here have, know about your consumer fraud statutes in, in the state, in Pennsylvania? How many people are familiar with it? Well, every state in this country, and I, I know because Iowa, where I'm from, is the last in order to enact this, gives a private right of action to consumers to sue merchants or to sue landlords in this case uh, for consumer fraud. And why this is so important is because the damages that flow with a consumer fraud cause of action are just enormous. And where this comes into play is when the landlord, let's say, doesn't disclose to a prospective tenant that you've had bed bugs, and that tenant rents an apartment, and that tenant gets bed bugs, um, that tenant can go back on the landlord and say, I was defrauded. And consumer fraud statutes in this country, uh, it, although it's, it's fraud, isn't really fraud in the sense that we're used to. I mean, you could be negligent and be held to have committed fraud under these statutes. And, and the damages aren't just damages for the lost rent. These damages triple. They're treble damages. They actually triple. So let's say that, and I'm going to give you some more examples, but just to give you an example, um, let's say you have rent of $1,000 a month that you're charging, and, and you rent it to somebody without making that disclosure, and they've lived with bed bugs for three months. It's not just $3,000 in a rebate and rent that you're looking at. You're looking at tripling that. You're looking at $9,000. You're looking at that lost property that they've lost times it by three, and we're not even getting yet to their, to their bites and the personal injuries. We're just, we're just getting to that one single tenant for rebate and rent and for lost property. And I pose to you that unless you have good insurance, we're going to talk about that later, the, the property damage is probably covered by your insurance. Your bodily injuries are covered by insurance. But you know what? That be, rebate and rent, that's probably not covered by your insurance. That's going to come out of your pockets. And that's going to be something you're going to have to pay for. Now, under the UDAP standards, uh, rental agreements have been held that they may not contain the legal hazards that endanger the occupant's well-being or make the unit unfit for habitation. A landlord who rents an apartment impliedly represents that it is in compliance with the applicable health and safety codes. If it is not, the landlord has committed consumer fraud, a UDAP violation. Collection of the full amount of rent while the unit is in violation of the housing code or where the unit has material defects rendering it unsafe or unfit is a UDAP violation. So know that when you rent a place with bed bugs, you are in effect committing an unfair deceptive act and practice. <coughs> to give you an example of how, uh, of, of how expansive that is, is that landlord is liable under UDAP statute if the conditions materially Im impair the health and safety or w and well-being of an occupant, whether or not the condition violates the housing code. So you don't even have, the, the tenant doesn't even have to prove that this condition violated a housing code. It could still rise to a level of consumer fraud, even though it doesn't even violate that housing code. So UDAP has even been, it's been so expanded that it, it's, it affords so much protection to consumers that again, but it all goes on. Has the landlord acted reasonably? Have they made the warnings? Have they done the inspections? Have they made repairs? Have they done the subsequent you know, measures when they knew there was a problem? If you don't do that and you rent places out without giving knowledge to tenants, you're going to be in trouble under your UDAP statute. And Pennsylvania has a good UDAP statute for consumers. Again, um, it talks we have, about... Jeff, oh, we have a question over here. Oh, a question? Where's the question? Oh, go ahead. You want to go back one slide? I'm sorry, you're going to have to explain that to me. If it doesn't violate the sanitary housing code, what's the damage to the tenant? What's the damage? Yeah. Well, uh, the housing code, get, you know, let me tell you, the, the, the laws, as you, as you probably have realized now, listen to the legislative update, and, the, and um, the housing codes and statutes trail way behind court actions. 
which means that, that these statutes, these ordinances that are placing specific burdens on, on, on apartment complexes and on hotel operators to do certain things lag behind the court system. Usually these cases go through the court systems, people get hit up with massive amount of damages, there's a lot of lawsuits, and it finally drives people to, to, to legislate, to, to create kind of the game, the, the ground rules and, and, and the rules of the game. But those rules of the game are usually created after the litigation has already hit. What this code, what this UDAP statute, is, which is already on the books, it is basically saying if you have a housing code violation, you're probably already past the situation where you have a UDAP violation. But they're saying it doesn't necessarily have to rise to a level of a violation, which means that the housing people may come out and say, well, yeah, there's a problem, but we're not going to go ahead and, and certify a violation. But it still may still impair the habitability of that premises. If you have bed bugs in that apartment and they're eating you, your housing people might say, well, we don't think it's a violation yet. But you know what? They still have a common or they still have a, a statutory right of action to go to court and it's gonna ultimately be up to the judge to make that decision or be up to a jury to make that decision. Thank you. Um, just some examples. How much time do I have left, Adam? Fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes? Okay. We're gonna skip through some of these. You had a question? Yeah, this liability, is that most right now what you're talking about is based on disclosure? Correct. Correct. The UDAP, the UDAP is based on disclosure. Okay, uh, um, it's it basically renting an apartment that you know is, is problematic, or it could be that once you know. Now a lot of states aren't just a disclosure. It's when the problem exists and you fail to to remedy it, it. It could still amount to consumer fraud. It all depends on your state statute. But but really, where these come into play is when you rent a place you don't make that disclosure or that you, that you allow people to continue living there on a month-to-month -month basis without making that disclosure and these people contract the bed bugs, they're going to come at you under the UDAP statute. Any Thank question? You. How does this pertain to units that are purchased? For example, like a retirement community. Are you still held to the same law that, like, if they purchase this apartment, then they, like, it's still our responsibility to treat that? A condominium unit, for instance? Yes. Well, what is the Housing Association's duties? Um, is, is the Housing Association take care of the infestations? I mean, I don't know, like, okay, my house. Nobody's going to come into my house. Whoever sold me the house isn't going to treat my house. But these people are buying this apartment in a retirement community. So I just don't know where the responsibility is. It's still my responsibility to treat that apartment once they own it. I, I would say it, it probably is. And, and here's the reason why is because. Um, by not treating that apartment, it's going to keep spreading. And it's going to go into other apartments, and you're not going to be able to rent other apartments without that disclosure. And, and to a certain extent, the, the, the management of, of, that, of that complex still has the responsibility to maintain the, those, that complex. It, it still has the overall maintenance, common areas, it's, um, and most likely the infestations is probably covered under your association, you know, contract. So yes, I would say that contractually it's probably going to be the responsibility of the retirement community to take care of that. Again, it's unfair to collect rents on an apartment containing numerous defects making it unfit and unhabitable where the landlord had notice of those defects and did not correct them. Um, just some examples. I'm not going to dwell on some of these examples, but these are just kind of examples of um, some UDAP violations. This particular one which is the Hayden case, um, which is the Massachusetts case, dealt with a situation where the apartment landlord was abusive and threatening and refused to repair the problem. Very important. When your tenants come to you and say, we have a bed bug problem, don't be mean to them. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it, if, if you do that, it's going to end up, you're going to end up testifying in a deposition why you were that way to them, and that's going to have a big impact on how a jury and how a court reacts to that case. Uh, don't be abusive, don't threaten them, don't say, you brought them in, you take care of it. Or, or this is your fault. I mean, just take care of the problem. It, it, nothing good comes out of being abusive and threatening and mean to the tenants when they disclose these problems. You need to encourage tenants to do that. You don't want to be in a situation where you discourage tenants to do that because the word gets out and the, the person, next person is going to say, well, why didn't you, you're going to say, why didn't you tell me about your bed book problem? You, they're going to say, well, yeah. 
my, my neighbor told you about it. You were mean to him, and I thought you'd evict me if, if, you, if I told you about it. So you, you don't want to get into a, a, a situation where you develop a reputation for being abusive and threatening the tenants. Just fix the problem. Um, some more um, examples of UDAP, but we're not gonna. We're gonna go into um, the measure of damages. Okay, the a North Carolina court, and I would say that you're probably the same way in Pennsylvania here, holds that the measure of damages for substandard housing conditions is the difference between the fair rental value of the property in its warranted condition and its actual fair rental value, but the damages cannot exceed the total amount of rent paid by the tenant. The good news is that when they start looking at a UDAP damages that if you rent it for $1,000, everything's going to be based, even if they triple it, on $1,000. It's going to triple $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. They can't get $12,000. You're, you're going to be limited based on that $1,000 base. Uh, but, but when you look at it, they say, well, how do you determine in a bed bug case what is the measure of damages? Now, let me ask you, if I came to you and said, I have this apartment, it's apartment 15, it's it's a thousand dollars a month, uh, but it has bed bugs. Would you take it? How many people would take that apartment? If I told you apartment fifteen has bed bugs in it, would you want to take it? How about if I offered it to you for a hundred dollars a month? Would you take that? If 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 you knew it had bed bugs. Well, no, you're not going to hire anybody. You can't afford to hire anybody. This the the the, the question is, is obvious. Is that if someone tells you they're going to rent you a place that has bed bugs, you're going to get eaten all day. Do you want to go ahead and be eaten for the next couple of weeks? Uh, the answer is probably going to be no. I, I really don't want to be bitten by bed bugs tonight. And if, I'll probably go to the next place and rent it. So really, the value of, of an infested apartment is really zero. I mean, it has no value. Okay. A landlord's continuous and systemic breach of an implied warranty of habitability has found to be unfair. Although not every breach of a warranty would be a violation, either an egregious or a continuous one would be as where the landlord continuously failed to remedy the defects beside, uh, despite notice and judicial proceedings. Which means once you're on notice that you have a bed bug issue, you need to do something about it. And finally, and I'm going to get to the damage calculations here to kind of show you some models of how this could affect you. A, a substantial and material defect of an implied warranty of habitability is a UDAP violation, even if negligent. And why that's important is that fraud usually required intent. Fraud normally requires some type of evil mind, some type of what you call scientist, some, some type of, of, of recklessness. But in the UDAP violation, you could be guilty of fraud even if you're negligent. Even if you were just negligent in the way you did things, it could, it could trigger those tripling of those damages. I'm going to skip ahead here to punitive damages. And I want to talk about a case that's out there. And if you do nothing else after the seminar, what I want you to do is write down this case name. It's Matthias versus ACOR. M-A-T-H-I-A-S versus A-C-C-O-R. You can even write the citation down there. The 347 F period 3D 672. Read this case. Now, this case, when it came down, now, this is important, it, it, that it wasn't about bed bugs. It was about punitive damages. It was about basically a 37 to 1 ratio of, of, of punitive damages to economic losses or, or, or actual damages. And it was basically decided by the most conservative judge in the appellate court in this country, Judge Posner, who makes... Bill O'Reilly looked like a bleeding heart liberal. This guy is so conservative. This, this guy is, and, and what it was, is a, it was a, against a, a Motel 6 where people were in the hotel for just a couple of days and gave, got bed bugs, and each were awarded 5,000 in, in compensatory damages and 186,000 in punitive damages. Now the hotel, they knew that the panel was Judge Posner, so they went ahead and made this argument. They said, we're going to look reasonable here. We know we're going to get hit up for something. But we're going to say, how about four to one? We'll give them, we, we, maybe at the most, we should, get, we should have to pay $20,000 for punitive damages, $5,000 for compensatory damages. That's a four to one ratio. Let's, that's super reasonable. We're going to argue that. So the hotel went ahead and argued that all they should have to pay is $20,000, and anything beyond $20,000 plus the $5,000 would be excessive. 
Judge Posner disagreed. And you got to read this opinion and look at the language that this conservative judge writes in this opinion. He ruled that evidence of gross negligence, indeed of recklessness and a strong sense of an unjustifiable failure to avoid a known risk was amply shown. And here are the factors that Judge Posner relied on. He relies on the discovery of the bed bugs, the failed attempts at spraying the rooms to exterminate the bed bugs, warnings by the PCO that the building needed to be closed and while every room was sprayed and a refusal of the hotel to comply, and knowledge of management level employees of the defendant of the risk and failure to take effective steps to eliminate or to warn guests. In a Matthias, Judge Posner pointed out that in, as the infestation continued, it began to reach farcical proportions. After pointing out, odd at that point, management didn't flee the motel. Now again, this is the most conservative jurist that we have in this country. And he basically discussed that the hotels acknowledged that the, to the exterminator that there was a major problem with bed bugs, and all that was being done about it was chasing them from room to room. <laughs> And the court understood, basically, and I'll summarize what they said here, that, that bed bugs don't transmit diseases, but they're unsightly, they're, they're horrible, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're painful to guess. And basically they said that the motel could rent the rooms to anybody at any price they wanted to if they would have warned of, about this, or warned them about the bed bugs. Now I'm going to tell you that a lot of states have these kind of what we call pseudo-reliance aspects on their UDAP case, which means that, that to, to some extent a, um, um, a consumer has to rely on representations made or non-disclosures made by the landlord. Um, just know that in the UDAP actions, uh, the courts have relaxed reliance, so it basically really doesn't even exist anymore. There really is no reliance on the fraud that you have to show. I'm going to go ahead and skip on, because we only have about 10 minutes left, to, um, first of all, I, just, I want to cover this real briefly. The majority approach under most states in consumer law statute is what they call benefit of the bargain damages, which is the value of the products is represented less the value delivered, which is more favorable to the consumer than out-of-pocket approach, which means they not only get out-of-pocket, but they also get the benefit of the bargain. And I'm going to skip to this part of the presentation, which is liability stems from uncertainty. You need to have the contract, you need to have a fee structure uh, with the pest control operator, and you need to have insurance. Um, the contract, make, the, make sure those terms are in writing, uh, specify the work to be performed, specify that it is for bed bugs, know that there's going to be probably no guarantees made or very limited guarantees. Um, specify the, 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 the PCO is going to specify the client's duties and you need to make sure that your PCO specifies what you need to do to comply with this contract, what you need to do to get ready for the treatments. You need to be prepared for the treatments and you need to make sure that the PCO specifies what the cost of the treatment is and aftercare because it's not just getting rid of the bed bugs, you need to make sure that they're gone, you need to have some type of, of aftercare of how you're going to make sure that they don't come back or if they do come back, how you're going to deal with them at that point in time. Now, what if the client does not want to spend the money? Well, the PCO will probably refuse the job, or the PCO is probably going to have the, the landlord sign something declining a service that they recommended. And how's that going to look in a courtroom? The PCO said to do X, Y, and Z. The landlord signs says, I declined. How's that going to look when you get sued? Now, the PCO might do something to say, well, we got to do something to help these people, but I pose to you, if you decline services that are recommended, it's not going to look good uh, when you get sued. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit to insurance. Your general liability policy. How many people have read their general liability policy of their apartment complex? Let me tell you, it doesn't cover much. It probably excludes more than it includes. Um, it probably does not cover bed bugs you're going to need a special writer. Insurance companies, especially ones that are insuring apartment complex and hotels, know about bed bug problems. They know, they've got opinions, they have coverage opinions, and it's not covered under, uh, for most causes of action. And so you're going to need a writer. Now, under your premises liability policy, 
you're probably covered for bodily injury. You're probably uh, covered for loss of property. But there's rebates and rents. You're probably not covered. And I, and I uh, will stress that even though I think you're covered under the first two, chances are you're going to get a, 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 what's called a reservation of rights letter where the insurance company is going to reserve the right not to cover you later on in the lawsuit. So you want to make sure you have um, a writer that covers this. And when you talk to your agents, when you leave here today, you want to put it in writing to them. I want specific insurance covering bed bug exposure. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm concerned about. And make sure that you tell your agent in writing what you're looking to do. Because if you get sued for a bed bug problem and it's not covered, you're going to be able to go back to the, that insurance company and say, I told my agent what I wanted to. They didn't provide the right insurance for me. I'm now bringing an action against the insurance company that, and the agent for, for basically errors and omissions. Because these are expensive propositions as we're going to get into. Um, because right now, although you're likely covered for bodily injury, even if in a coverage dispute you would be, probably likely covered for, your prop, for the property damages, you are unlikely at this point to be recovered for your rebates and rent. And under the UDAP statute, the plaintiff's attorney is entitled to prevailing attorney fees. And I pose to you that it's not an attorney fee based on what his regular hourly rate is. If he's charging $200 an hour, it's based on prevailing market rates. It's probably going to be about $350 or $400 an hour by the time you get done. And those fees add up quickly on the UDAP case. Now, under UDAP, um, basically, you basically have triple damages and you have attorney fees. Um, somebody has to pay these damages. It's going to be a deep pocket. It's going to be you. Now, if you get sued, the first thing you need to do is call your insurance carrier. Tell them that you've been sued. Eventually, it's a numbers game. There's, if, when these, this bed bug problem is exploding, the problem's exploding, you need, to, you need to call your agent when you do get sued and tell them about it. Call your lawyer. Do not call the plaintiff. Do not call the plaintiff's lawyer. Three minutes? Okay. Uh, again, also, do not talk to the press. Nothing comes good about talking to the press when you get sued. Call the lawyer. Call your insurance agent. The question, again, isn't whether you're going to get sued. It's, it's, some of you will get sued. There's no question. I'm going to tell you about our Iowa class action model just to give you some real quick, I'm going to run through some damage calculations about how this bed bug problem could add up for you. Again, we're looking at property damages, rebate and rent, personal injuries, attorney fees. Property damages for things like bedding, furniture, clothing. Let's say a low example. Everyone's property that's, that has to be replaced is $250. Real low. We're going to be reasonable here. Rebate and rent. What's an infested uh, unit worth? Zero. Let's say we have a monthly rent of $500 for three months. That's $1,500. Let's say the, the bites that they get, the disfigurement, the personal injury, is worth $2,000 for the bites, pain and suffering, $2,000. Let's say they went to the doctor twice or once. Medical bills, $500, $4,500. That's pretty low for one of these cases. Now under UDAP, when we add it up, we see that we have property damages. It's 250 times 3, that's 750. The rebate and rent, 1,500 times 3, that's 4,500. Personal injury, they don't get the triple those because those aren't part of UDAP. So in the personal injury, we're just going to stay right now at $2,500 for the total personal injury claim. So we're going to get even more reasonable. That's $7,750 for that one plaintiff in a single unit. Now attorney fees, we figure at a $300 rate, which is pretty reasonable for, you know, for a Lodestar rate, even, and probably very low for Pittsburgh. Um, let's say that it takes them two days to work up this case and try the case. That's one day of pleadings, phone calls, prep, depositions, everything they're doing, and one day of trial. At $300 an hour, that's $4,800. And I pose you that, that it's going to take a lot longer. So I'm just being very ultra reasonable here. So the total cost for a single resident, a single unit that had a three-month unreasonable infestation is $12,550. Now let's look at a class action model. Let's say that you have 100 units in your apartment complex and it was a total infestation because you didn't take care of the problem when you were supposed to. You have 7,750 per plaintiff, 100 plaintiffs, that's 
Now the attorney fees at 350,000 is going to be a bargain because that basically is someone that hasn't gone through much of the case that's pre-trial. You're talking about over a million dollars in a 100 unit apartment complex, assuming there's only one person per unit. So you can see how these damages add up very quickly, but understand that liability stems from no warnings, no action, and arrogance. If you do the right thing, you, you do it the right way, you have a PC uh, press control operator at the outset, you follow his recommendations, you're probably going to be okay. If you don't, you're going to be looking at those numbers. Uh, thank you very much.